Hey musical scientists, welcome to my new room. Look how YouTube-y it is. I've got the colored lights, I've got the cubby with the things in it, like the signs and the books to show that I'm knowledgeable, and I've got the YouTube logo up there, but subtly so you know that I'm a YouTuber, but you don't think I'm too full of myself. Um, anyways, welcome to this space. Um, just moved in, it's looking pretty good. The studio's really not set up yet, um, but I'm working hard on the new song. I've been reading many books about, well, if you've been following my Twitter, you you know probably what the song is and also what it's about. So we're back, finally, with another episode of Science Life. This is a conversation that I filmed when I was still back at my previous place, and it's one of my favorite conversations I've ever done, I think. Um, as you can see by the title, I talked with Sean Carroll, who's a physicist at Caltech, um, interested mostly in cosmology, although his interests are incredibly broad and we get into all sorts of things from details of physics for which he has very intuitive explanations, um, going farther afield to morality and the meaning of life and that kind of thing. So this was a really fun conversation because I also have a really broad range of interests, as you can tell by the fact that I never stick on one topic for more than a little section of the time. Um, I get a little embarrassed sometimes during this, even though it was my, one of my favorite conversations because um, Sean catches me in a bit of an error sometimes. But I'm going to share it with you anyways, and hopefully we can both learn something. And if you have any comments or questions or criticisms or thoughts, I would love to see them down in the comments or down in the comments on SoundCloud or iTunes if you're watching it, if you're listening to it there. I want to make a note on how I'm going to be releasing these conversations from now on. I think a lot of people found that releasing them both as an hour-long segment and as those 20-minute blocks was really blowing up your subscription feed, and I had a few people complaining about that. And I, I think I agree with you. Like, it's too much for me to do both the hour and the 20 minute segments. But I know some people also had commented saying that they don't have time to watch a whole hour and they would really like to see it in little chunks. So for those people, I've made a second channel, another second channel, called Science Life. Uh, the link will be right down there. You can go and subscribe to it. And on that channel, I'll be uploading these conversations in more digestible segments. If you only got 15 or 20 minutes at a time, and you still want to consume this kind of thing, please go there. Otherwise, you can keep watching Science Life right here in its full form, or you can subscribe on iTunes or Stitcher or listen on SoundCloud. Um, it's all over the place, assuming SoundCloud doesn't go bust in the near future. Anyways, without further ado, here's my conversation with Sean Carroll. We're the spice. We're the flavor of the universe. <laughs> Okay, I'm here with Sean Carroll, who's a physicist at Caltech. Um, he wrote my general relativity textbook. He's written many popular science books on a myriad of subjects, and I think he has a real clarity at explaining things of all sorts. So without further ado, hi, Sean. How's it going? Well, my singing voice is just terrible. I mean, there's not every <laughs> talent is uh, equally distributed there. Well, you, it's good there's to be only thanks. There's only so much you can fit into one human brain. <laughs> I suppose. But you, right. you seem to have a broader interest than, like, a broader range of interests than a lot of people do. You sort of branch all over the place with your, with your interests. Is that, have you always been like that? Is that? Are, yeah, I think that's yeah. right. It's, a, it's something that I've always uh, wanted to do. You know, I never wanted to, never would be happy if I were just doing exactly the same thing over and over and over again. And that means both that I, you know, do science research, but do other things like writing books and playing poker and whatever. But also in the science research that I do, I don't tend to stick to exactly the same kind of problems over and over again. And that there's good aspects and bad aspects about that. You learn new things and therefore maybe bring a different perspective, but also you're not always the world's expert in what you're doing. So there's always a learning curve uh, facing your near future. Well, you are sort of the world's expert in what you're, in what you're particularly doing, though. You just, you just seem to branch out into a million other things as well, which I think is... Well, but I'm not. Right now I'm doing things like quantum information theory and the foundations of quantum mechanics, which I'm not the world's expert in, or non-equilibrium statistical mechanics. Hmm. So as soon as I become the world's expert in something, I start doing something else. That's the problem. <laughs> do you just get bored with it? Do you, do you find that once you've made a contribution, you have more interesting things you're trying to jump to, or what's going on? That's part of it, you know. Part of it is uh, our lifespans are very short compared to all the interesting things there are to do in the world. So you have to uh, switch around if you want to cover as many as you can. And another part is I do believe that you stay fresh by trying new things, even though it makes you feel like you're always a graduate student and never a, a 
senior faculty member, uh, you can maybe bring new ideas into the field if it's if it's new to you. People get into a rut and do things a certain way. And I want to sort of always be be faced with different kinds of challenges, and who knows what's going to happen from that. Right. That's kind of. I mean, that's kind of what I do as well. Right. I get just enough information that I feel like I can synthesize it down into a five minute segment right. with videos and things, and then. I, I move on to something else. I think for me, it's more, it, it's really just internal. It's that I'm trying to get a sense of how everything works, right? Yeah. And so as long as I, as long as there are large sort of swaths of the conceptual space that I haven't even mapped out in broad detail, I'm not necessarily interested in going into the, the little bits and focusing my entire life on one thing. I have this whole section of say, uh, genomics or economics right. or whatever yeah, else yeah. it is, right? Yeah, no, I know. I mean, when I'm learning about information theory and complexity and things like that, I mean, there's clearly very interesting things going on that I'm not an expert in. But maybe what I do as a theoretical physicist is close enough that I can move in there slowly and gradually rather than just throwing away everything I've already done and starting completely afresh, which is something that I'm not quite uh, courageous enough to actually do. Right. So this information complexity stuff, is it is it more related to what you were talking about in, in your latest book about like complexity as it pertains to life and that kind of side? Or is it is it more of the emergent gravity type things or what do you apply? Well, it's it a little bit of both. Yeah, I mean, I it, it was actually goes back to the first popular book I wrote, which was From Eternity to Here about entropy in the arrow of time. OK, um, I'm not sure how much should I how, how much should I explain about entropy in the arrow of time? Um, you can give a little summary. I mean, I think probably most people here have have seen the the one video I did on the subject. Exactly. Five minutes so long. what else do they need? But I'll just in case they didn't watch it yet. Well, that um, pretty much just sets up the problem. It doesn't really propose right. any solutions. It's just here's the conundrum. Yeah. So there's the arrow of time, the fact that the past and the future are different from each other, which is only a problem because that's not built into the laws of physics at a fundamental level. Newton's laws or Schrodinger's equation don't make any distinction between past and future, but the universe clearly does. And physicists explain that by saying that entropy used to be low and is growing. Entropy being a way of talking about the disorderliness, messiness, disorganization of things. So the universe started near the Big Bang 14 billion years ago in a state of very, very low entropy. And the entropy has been going up and will continue to go up for a long time. It's becoming a more and more disorganized universe. So that is something that I've been studying as a cosmologist for a long time. Why is it that the entropy was so low at the beginning? But even if you knew that, there's still many, many questions to be answered about how exactly did you go from that low entropy early point to our current situation and where will you go into the future? And one aspect of that is how did complexity arise? Uh, how does structure arise in the universe? Or even beyond the fact that entropy increases, you know, how does entropy increase? Exactly in what way does it increase? So I started thinking about that and it, it led me to learn more things about statistical mechanics. And there's been a revolution in statistical mechanics in the last 15 or 20 years because we're looking at small systems. You know, if you have uh, Ludwig Boltzmann back in the 1800s showed that you can explain the growth of entropy if you think that matter is made of atoms and particles just rearranging itself into ever more likely configurations. But that's only probably going to happen. If you're mm -hmm. down at the level where you have five or six particles, not 10 to the 25 particles, then sometimes entropy will go down, sometimes it will go up. And we understand that kind of thing a lot better now than we did just 20 years ago. And that might have something to do with why complex structures arise in, as the universe expands and cools. And of course, life is the paradigmatic, very, very complex structure. So it might even have something to do with the origin of life. Right. I think there's there was sort of a, I, I had to flip around my understanding of the, of the arrow of time and the, the second law of thermodynamics, I think, because when I learned it, when I first learned the second law of thermodynamics, it was presented as, as like a law of, okay, the universe marches forward in time, there's right. a way that it's going, and then this is something, because the universe marches forward in time, and things happen throughout time, they move from states of, of low entropy to states of high entropy, because they are, if they're organized, they won't stay organized. But there's, there's kind of this reversal where it's the fact that they were organized, they are organized in, in one direction of time and disorganized in another direction of time that points the arrow, that causes it to be from here to there. 
Exactly, that's right. And uh, Boltzmann understood this uh, back in the 1890s anyway, and still a lot of people don't understand this. They, they really resist the idea that the reason why time seems to flow in one direction, the reason why we all remember the past but don't remember the future, it's all because entropy is increasing. And right. Boltzmann did fool himself a little bit. He thought he explained why entropy was increasing. What he really explained was why entropy increases from today to tomorrow. What he never was able to explain is why it was it is higher today than it was yesterday. Right. And that's ultimately a cosmology question. You got to go back to the Big Bang. Right. The reason it was it was higher yesterday was that it was higher, even higher the day before. Lower, even lower than the day before, yes. Even lower than the day before, yes. <laughs> That's exactly um, right, and it goes back 14 billion years to the Big Bang. And, of course, Boltzmann didn't know about the Big Bang. He was talking in the 1890s. Big Bang didn't really settle into something we believed in until the 1920s at the earliest. Can you explain your like your pet theory about, about baby universes springing off and, and forming, like, Ever increasing entropy in sort of this multiverse because I think I I touched on that in about one line in the song and that was all I had time for I feel like it doesn't quite do it justice maybe there'll be a sequel song or something like that a follow up but if you um, explain it well enough that I get it yeah you know I think it's a uh, it's an idea I had with a graduate student I was working with at the time Jennifer Chen back in 2004 and the setup is the following you know if what you're trying to explain is why the universe ever had a low entropy. And people have tried to explain this in many, many ways. But the problem is, any way you do it, there's always more ways for the universe to be high entropy than to be low entropy. So if you don't simply set a condition, just make it a law of nature that the universe started with low entropy, if you want to explain it dynamically, it's very, very hard. But you can ask yourself, what, what does high entropy look like? And the answer is, well, it's where the universe is going. The universe is emptying out, right? In Einstein's universe, where space can expand, the highest entropy state is the state with no stuff, with all the stuff in the universe scattered to the four winds. So you're left with nothing but empty space. And you say, how in the world can that make a universe? Can that lead to something like our Big Bang? So the answer we suggested are these baby universes, the idea that there can be a quantum fluctuation of space-time itself that takes this big empty universe and in a little tiny region pinches off a little bubble, and almost always when that happens, the bubble just recollapse and no one will notice anything. But occasionally, if conditions are just right, that bubble can expand and grow into its own universe, completely disconnected from ours. And the idea is that the easiest bubbles to make are the smallest ones. And when you combine the fact that the bubble is small with the fact that it has to be just right in order to expand and make a universe, it means that it's going to be very, very low entropy. Okay. So the whole shebang, the previous pre-existing empty universe, plus all the baby universes, is a system where entropy keeps going up even though the particular place that our baby universe starts with is a low entropy condition, hopefully like our Big Bang. I think the, the thing that I, I'm confused about with this theory, and maybe it's just something that isn't understood well enough, but the information question seems really strange to me. So how do you get, how do you pinch off a microscopic bubble from a parent universe and have enough quantum information in that bubble to expand into an entire universe full of particles and space and, and entropy flying all around? Like, is that, is that understood at all? Or would we need some sort of theory of how, how much information is in space to even get there? Well, we think that it's like, we, we think we have the broad outlines of the understanding. It's a, it's a wonderful feature of quantum mechanics. When you say that the early universe, forget about baby universes and the multiverse and all the complicated okay. stuff. Just take our actual universe, right? Uh, the one that we think we live in started out with low entropy. What that means is that the quantum state of that universe was very, very particular. It was very, very special. It's one of this, not that many states that look that way. Right. And today, we have a lot of entropy, which means there's many, many states that look the way our universe looks today. So you ask yourself, well, how did that one little simple thing turn into this thing that has all this information? And where did the information come from? And the answer in the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics is because the wave function of the universe branched. When we started at early times, we had a very simple, uniform um, unified wave function of the universe and then it splits every time some quantum mechanical interaction happens and so th this is what we call the branching of the wave function if you observe a particle that's spinning clockwise or counterclockwise you get one universe where it was spinning clockwise and you saw it spinning clockwise another universe where it was spinning counterclockwise and you saw it spinning counterclockwise 
So this happens whether you like it or not. You don't need people or conscious observers to make this happen. Anytime different quantum systems interact with each other and entangle with each other, this is going to happen. So basically, the universe starts very simple, but it differentiates over time. It branches into many, many different things. And the individual pieces can be very complex and carry a lot of information, even though the whole shebang is actually a very simple thing if you knew how to put it back together. Okay. Yeah, I think my, my question was, and maybe I'll explain this a little bit to, to the listeners, there's this idea in quantum mechanics that what really constitutes the universe is not so much a physical space as, as this mathematical Hilbert space, right? So you've right. got all these, the, the universe, everything in the universe can be characterized by a, a set of vectors in a very complex, multidimensional, perhaps infinitely dimensional, at least very high dimensional vector space. In fact, and just by one vector. Yeah, by by a single vector, if it's a yeah, if it's a pure state, um, in a single a single vector, that basically just stays there. It doesn't really do anything. When you when you try to measure things that have to do with particular properties that only that you you're only thinking about a subset of that space, it'll it'll rotate around in a strange way that gives you the appearance of observables moving around and changing. But the Hilbert space itself stays pretty much fixed, and the vector itself stays pretty much fixed. So I think my my question is. Can a, can a very small universe have a large enough Hilbert space to blow up into the Hilbert space that now constitutes our present universe? Yeah, I think the answer is yes. There's no problem with that at all because Hilbert space isn't changing. Hilbert space is the space of possibilities. Okay. When you say the universe is very, very low entropy, you mean it's in a very, very particular part of that space of possibilities. But I, I mean, you said that the universe doesn't, the wave function doesn't evolve over time. That's possible, but it's not at all settled. In fact, I think it's equally likely the wave function does evolve over time. Okay. Um, there's this argument we have about whether or not time itself is fundamental or emergent, which is a great argument to have. But I think it's okay for our current purposes to imagine that time is real, it's really fundamental, the universe is really evolving, which means that that wave function of the universe moves from the very simple low entropy region of Hilbert space to the more complicated looking regions of Hilbert space. So it starts where there's only one branch and everything always looks simple. It moves to a place where there are many, many, many branches and on, on every branch things look complicated. But secretly there's a relationship between all those branches, namely that if you went backward everything would simplify as time went on. Hmm. Okay. I, I want to, I, I think, I think one of the things I want to do in this conversation is I want to run by you some things that I'm just confused about um, good. in, in physics, because I think <laughs> that you're, you're remarkably good at, at pinning down explanations that are, are intuitive. And that's sort of my goal is to, I sort of have this feeling that if I've seen the math and worked it out, but I don't have a sense of why yeah. I got from step one to step 50, then I don't actually understand what's going on. I've just I think, I think you're right. I like your yeah. intuition there. Yes, that's right. So one of the things that confuses me greatly, and I saw you tweet about this, um, is gauge theories and the, this idea of, especially uh, what, what, what are called Yang-Mills gauge theories, this, yeah. these groups of, of symmetries that, that the different fields in our universe obey that they can rotate among in each other. And I learned about this in a very complicated mathematical way, I think. <laughs> um, I mean, first I learned about it in <clears throat> particle physics, and then I started learning, learning about it in terms of um, these ideas of fiber bundles, and it was, it was a, a mathematical mess. Um, yeah, and I've, right. I've been trying to find a way to simplify it in the way that I can you know, show it in a video or animate it on a screen or something, and I, I'm, I'm sort of hitting my head against a wall. So do you have a way that you like to explain this kind of thing? Well, it's not easy, certainly. I guess I made my most explicit concerted attempt in the book I wrote about the Higgs boson. Um, at the beginning of the book, it's very user-friendly and telling chatty stories about people building particle accelerators. And two-thirds of the way through, I try to explain gauge theories mm. uh, to people. And it's not easy. But the, the basic idea, um, I, I think the basic idea does make sense. It, the, the idea of the gauge symmetry is that there's some feature of your theory that you can sort of uh, measure or talk about in different ways and it doesn't matter which way you measure or talk about it. So the classic example is if you measure the length of something, it doesn't matter whether you use inches or feet or centimeters or meters or anything like that. These are different ways of measuring the same physical thing. 
Another classic example is just uh, directions in space. Like at every point on the Earth, we define north and south, and that helps us find things. But we could have chosen a different way to put down lines of longitude and latitude. That was a completely arbitrary choice that we made. So it turns out there's there's two amazing facts about the real world. One is that the world is made of fields, not particles, like uh, things that you talk about a quark, and you think of a quark as a particle, but really it's a field that fills all of space, and the particle is a vibration in that field. A photon is a vibration in the electromagnetic field. Likewise, a quark is just a vibration in the quark field. That's one amazing fact. Uh, but it turns out that there's this symmetry, this gauge kind of symmetry, because quarks are not just a single kind of quark. They come in three different colors, right? So every quark has like three axes for red, green, and blue. And it doesn't matter how you rotate those axes into each other. There's, yeah, nothing, there's nothing that's fundamentally green about a particular quark. It's just one right. of three possibilities, all of which or you can label in whatever way you want. green and blue, right? You know, you can right. really just rotate it all the way around. And it's, it's more like a sphere type thing where you can go in any direction. Yeah, it's more like any direction in a three-dimensional space works perfectly well. In fact, it's worse than that because there's complex numbers, not real numbers, but who cares about all these details? The point is that you're choosing arbitrarily what to call red, green, blue, and what to call combinations. Hmm. The second amazing fact is that this symmetry, this freedom you have to choose what's a red quark, what's a green quark, what's a blue quark, exists separately at every point in space. So just like in principle on here on the Earth, I could separately define what I mean by north, south, east, west at every point on the globe. That would be, you know, difficult if we didn't do it in some sensible way, but in principle we could do it. Well, the same thing is true with the quarks. We can define what we mean by red, green, blue separately at every point in space. So clearly you need some way to compare a quark at one point in space to another point in space. And the answer is that there is a field, a field that tells you how to compare the quark set up over here to the quark set up over there. Just like on your globe, there is sort of a set of lines of latitude and longitude that tell you how to compare something pointing north at one point to something point, pointing north somewhere else. And this field, this field that, that connects the different ways of talking about red, green, and blue quarks at different points in space is called a connection or a gauge field. And that field itself can have energy and it can push the quarks apart or pull them together. And in the case of quarks, we call this the gluon field. But the same thing is true for electrons and protons. We call it the electromagnetic field. There's all these fields filling space that let us compare the different ways that we're choosing to measure the reality of the different fields. And it's just like, you know, if we, if the, the example I use in my book is, uh, imagine like a topographic map, like you have some hilly kind of landscape and you, you, you compare how you're defining up and down, left and right, and that induces a slope, that induces a, you know, a thing that you wanna be pushed down or, or pulled up or whatever. And so if you, if you get good at this, you start viewing the world as suffused in empty space with all these invisible fields. And some of them are vibrating and giving rise to particles like quarks and electrons. And some of them are just connecting how we talk about the different quarks and electrons to each other. And those are the gauge fields that give rise to the forces of nature. The thing that confuses, I, I think that gets confusing about that ex explanation of, of gauge theory is that when you talk about it sort of the field is like a labeling system that allows you to map on points to other points. It doesn't seem obvious that that should be a dynamical thing, right? Like when you when you put down the field lines on the Earth or the, the lines of latitude and longitude, they just right. sit there and they tell you how to map this right. point to that point, and they they don't wave around and and form interesting little particles that shift from one place to another. They just That's are. Because you think of the surface of the Earth as fixed, right? Of course it's not, right? Continents move, you could crush the Earth or whatever. It takes a lot of energy to do that. Mm. The, in the, these fields we're talking about, the same thing is true, but it just takes a little bit of energy to do it. It, does take, it takes much, much less energy to do it. Uh, it, is, it is a little bit of a leap of faith if you don't follow the math, the idea that somehow there's energy contained in this abstract answer to the question, how do I compare? Uh, particles at one point to particles at another point, but uh, that's the way it is. You know, at some <laughs> point, it's you know, it, you always reach 
the level where the analogies start breaking down. And you have to say, well, if you want me to show you the equations, I can do you that. Otherwise, you have to buy that this is how things actually work. Yeah, you just you just have to intuit it. And then it gets even worse with, with like strong coupling and gluons because you can't even show people the equations for certain things that we think are true about the, the gluon field, for example, this idea that gluons are confined and they, they, don't, they don't get out of the nucleus very far. That there's yeah, you can wave your hands and draw pretty pictures, but uh, it's not a very, very accurate representation of the underlying math. Yeah, that's right. I mean, forgetting about going to 10-dimensional string theory, right? Then, you know, <laughs> uh, pictures become very complicated indeed. Yeah, for sure. With the, uh, do, you, do you feel like there's, have you made any progress in, in explaining to the world that the world is fields as opposed to particles? Well, um, it's hard because I think that uh, it's hard for a number of reasons. One is because there's two different ways in which the world is made of fields, and these ways are often mixed up with each other. One is that the world is quantum mechanical, right? That, in fact, if you just take an electron, uh, it's not a particle. It has a wave function. And we talk about the two-slit experiment, and the electron can interfere with itself, and all of these aspects of quantum mechanicalness, mm. which certainly, uh, when you talk about wave-particle duality in quantum mechanics, that's because you go from a point-particle description in classical mechanics to a wave function in quantum mechanics. But then there's this whole other way that the world is wave-like, which is that if you want to include relativity into your description, then the thing that you apply quantum mechanics to isn't a collection of particles, it's a collection of fields, like the electromagnetic field, or the gluon field, or the electron field, or the quark field, or the neutrino field, etc. So that's saying that what you think of as a particle, even before you quantized it, it wasn't a particle. It was a little vibrating uh, essence of waviness right there in the middle of space. And the closest you can come to making that connection is to say that it's quantum mechanics that turns waves into what we perceive as particles. And you can talk about, depending on where they are in their physics education, you know, the simple harmonic oscillator, just an oscillator rocking back and forth, uh, like on a spring or something like that. Classically, it can do whatever it wants. Quantum mechanically, it has energy levels. It's in its lowest energy state, its first excited state, its second excited state, and so forth. Uh, if they haven't done the harmonic oscillator yet, you can talk about the drum head, right? You can say, like, here's a drum head, or here is a, uh, a violin string mm. tied at different ends. And if the string were just flopping loosely, you could do whatever it want. But once you tie it at different ends, then there's uh, you know a first harmonic and second harmonic and the overtones and so forth. What ter what started out as a continuous space of possibilities becomes discrete when you have these boundary conditions, and that's where particles come from. The fact that you know the these particles uh, take energy to make. Uh, the, the fields take energy to, to get them vibrating, and the magic of quantum mechanics says either you see zero vibrations or one particle's worth of vibrations or two particles, never three and a half particles worth of vibrations. Right, yeah, like the, the thing about the, Schro the, like the one particle Schrodinger equation as you see it written down in these undergraduate courses is that it's not really, it's not really quantum mechanics, right? It's just a, a, an a a low energy approximation of the Dirac equation. Like you can get it out without ever doing anything quantum mechanical about it. Well, yeah, but I, I would I would say that that's almost a coincidence. There's not that many equations you can write down <laughs> with uh, very few terms in them uh, in the non-relativistic limit. So okay. uh, I would I would say it the other way around. I would say that the Schrodinger equation that you write down for a single non-relativistic particle really is quantum mechanical, but it's not the real world. It's not the quantum mechanical theory of our actual reality. Our actual reality is made of fields. Those fields have their own Schrodinger equation, and like you say, when you apply that big quantum field theory Schrodinger equation to the case of just one little vibration in one little field, and then take the non-relativistic limit, mm. it looks like the ordinary non-relativistic Schrodinger equation. This is something I've actually I've been trying to figure out, because it seems to me almost a miracle that quantum mechanics works sort of up through the levels of analysis. That you can, you can yeah. start with a quantum mechanical field, but then if you ignore it and just find a, treat it as a single particle and you do quantum mechanics to it, you get something that looks like the world. And then yes. 
if you <laughs> if you say treat the entire helium atom as a boson and you do quantum mechanics to it, you get super, super fluidity and it still works. And if you do that to say sound waves, then you get phonons and yet phonons can still actually act quantum mechanically. And I'm right. not I'm not sure I understand why it should be that at any level other than the fundamental level you could you could complete this picture. It's a good, very good question. I mean, but I'm not sure. So I'm not going to claim the answer is simple because I don't know what the answer is. And I think it's a excellent thing to think about. But on the other hand, I mean, let's put it the other way. The universe is quantum mechanical. Uh, why shouldn't it look quantum mechanical at every <laughs> single level of uh, focus that you look at it at? You know, Fair we, enough. We live in a world that is well approximated by classical mechanics, right? So the miracle is that we can ignore quantum mechanics to a very, very good approximation as we go through our everyday lives. And that's right. something that is also hard to explain. We think that we can do it uh, to a certain level of satisfaction, but just the fact that you don't notice entanglement or superposition or tunneling in your everyday life is kind of an underappreciated amazing fact. You don't notice it until you until you make it very intentional, until you perform yeah, that until experiment. Yeah, you go to lab and learn quantum mechanics and do it for yourself. That's right. Brings the quantum into the macroscopic world. You you and make, yourself, do, right. you make yeah. yourself a Schrodinger cat. Yes. And then you can observe it. That's right. Yeah, so it's a weird thing that we all agree quantum mechanics is how the world goes, and yet it is work to manifest the weirdness of quantum mechanics at the macroscopic level. Right. Do you have a favorite interpretation of quantum mechanics? Are you sold on one or the other? I am a many worlds Everettian interpretation of quantum mechanics person. Yeah, no question. Okay, okay. Do you want to explain what that what that entails, and maybe why why one should believe that there should be many worlds as opposed to just one? It seems very complicated. Sure, it is actually very simple. It's exactly the opposite of complicated, I would claim. So. The point is that when we get taught quantum mechanics, if you ever get taught quantum mechanics in, uh, in your college courses, we'll teach you something like the following thing. Here's an electron. It can be in a superposition of spinning clockwise and spinning counterclockwise, right? So what that means is that it's really not one or the other, but we don't know. That's not correct. It really is a little bit spinning clockwise and a little bit spinning counterclockwise. And there can be an equation, some version of the Schrodinger equation, that says how the electron evolves over time. So that's fine, that's very parallel to classical mechanics, but then there are these extra rules that we get in quantum mechanics that tell us what happens when you observe or measure the system. You never observe the electron to be in a superposition of spinning clockwise and counterclockwise. If you ask it, are you spinning counterclockwise or clockwise, you always get one answer or the other. And you get it with a certain probability, and that probability is given by a certain equation. So this is the weird part of quantum mechanics. The existence of superpositions is no big deal. That's just a mathematical thing you can write down. And the evolution through time is very similar to what Newton would have been happy with. It's the process of measurement that seems very, very weird. So that's where different interpretations of quantum mechanics come in. What do you mean? What really happens when you make a measurement? So the Everettian says, look, nothing, there's nothing called making a measurement. They're, erase all of those rules that you were taught. The whole entirety of quantum mechanics is there are systems that can be in superpositions, and they evolve according to the Schrodinger equation. That's it. That's all there is. And then you say, well, but when I look at an electron, I never see it in a superposition. So how do I reconcile that empirical fact about the world with this, this very minimalist interpretation of quantum mechanics? The answer is that the Everettian says, well, just like the electron can be in a superposition of spin clockwise and spin counterclockwise, you can be in a superposition. You can be in a superposition of having seen the electron spinning clockwise and having seen the electron spinning counterclockwise. And I could solve the equation. There's an equation governing you, just like there's an equation governing the electron. And this thing we call the act of observation brings you together with the electron. And the phenomenon of entanglement happens. So now the whole system, you and the electron, is in a superposition. The superposition is you saw the electron spinning counterclockwise and the electron was spinning counterclockwise. That's one part of it. And the other part is you saw the electron spinning clockwise and it was spinning clockwise. And the Everettian just says, they're both real, both parts of the equation. There's no miracle by which one of those parts went away. Everyone agrees, by the way, that if you just take the quantum state and evolve it using Schrodinger equation, and that's all you do, you and the electron will evolve into the superposition. 
the thing that people disagree on is what to do about it. The Everettian says, believe in it. They're both there. There's a you that saw the electron spinning one way. There's a you that saw the electron spinning the other way. Other people say, no, we got to work hard to get rid of those other possibilities that you don't see anymore because I don't like them. I don't, it bothers my emotional state to think there's other parts of me that saw other things. Uh, so it's all a matter of how bothered you are by it. Uh, I think that at some point, if you're not bothered by it, the math works out beautifully and it fits all the data and you just get on with your life to do other things. Yeah, my supervisor, uh, Alex Maloney, had a great way to explain this, using the fact that most people have heard of Schrodinger's cat and have kind of, I, are kind of okay with Schrodinger's cat or, or like to say they're okay with Schrodinger's cat to sound cool, especially if they're <laughs> undergraduate yeah. physicists. They'll tell you very emphatically that, oh, that, no, the cat, is, the cat is both alive and dead. And then when you open the box, the <clears> cat <throat> collapses into being an alive cat or a dead cat. Right. And, and Alex's point was, it does not. You, you open the box and the cat splits you into a person who is happy at seeing an alive cat and a person who is sad at seeing a dead cat. And then exactly. you go on with your life, none, knowing yep. none the wiser. <laughs> of course, Schrodinger himself was not happy. That's why he invented it. He invented <clears throat> the thought experiment because he didn't think quantum mechanics should apply to macroscopic systems like cats. He says, surely you don't believe that the cat is both alive and dead, right? right. These days we're happier with it, we say, yes, that is what we believe. And then, like you say, the question is, what happens when you open the box? It's just, it, we, we accept that it's odd and we move on with our lives. Yeah, so I think that, you know, if th there's a lot of work to be done in taking this Everettian idea that quantum mechanics is very simple. It's superpositions evolving in time, and we just have to learn to deal with it. It's a lot of work to be done figuring out how that plays out in the real world, whether it's the lab when you're actually measuring things, or whether it's the early universe and you're studying the Big Bang and whatever. So I'm, that's part of what I do. There's lots of unanswered questions here, but I, I, I'm just not sympathetic to the idea that it's so repulsive that we have to mess with the rules of quantum mechanics to get rid of these other worlds. Do you, do you have any sense of, like, I've, I've heard you talk about this briefly, about why questions, and about always going, going deeper and finding bottom levels, or like, like levels yeah. below levels of, of this, you know, quantum field theory is based on string theory, or string theory might be based on string field theory, or whatever, down right. and down and down. Do you have a sense of, I guess, I guess two things, whether there's a level below quantum mechanics, and also do... Does it make sense to have a bottom level of things? I think it does. I think it does make sense to have a bottom level of things because there's the universe. Like whenever people say, well, maybe there is no theory of everything, um, I think the universe is the theory of everything. Like what the universe actually does, whatever way there is to talk about that, if I found the way that did it completely accurately, that would be the theory of everything. It might not be simple, might not be easy to write down on a t-shirt or whatever, but if the universe does something, it might even be like different from time to time, who knows? But whatever the universe does is that theory that we're looking for. We seem to so far be very, very fortunate in that uh, the regularities and the patterns we find in how nature behaves lead us to believe that the universe is fundamentally simple, but we can't take that for granted, that might go away. As far as quantum mechanics is concerned, you know, it, it, I think that it's an open question whether quantum mechanics is the bedrock way that things work at the most fundamental level or whether it's just, you know, the, like you think that classical mechanics was the per first big paradigm for physics and quantum mechanics was the second one. Maybe there's 100 or 10 to the 100 more yet to come that we don't know about, right? Um, I don't know how I would ever be able to judge the difference between those two things. It's very, very hard to modify quantum mechanics or to generalize it in any way. People have tried. Um, one obvious way is to introduce discrete time instead of continuous time, but that's kind of a small tweak at the fundamental aspects of things. So, and there's no evidence experimentally, right? There's nothing that we see in the world that says that quantum mechanics isn't just right. So, um, I think that the right thing to do right now, given our understanding of the universe, is to try to understand quantum mechanics better, right. more than trying to replace it with something even more comprehensive. But or we should be open-minded that someday that's going to have to happen. So you don't get too bothered about about why questions as long as as long as the theory works. No, I wouldn't say that. It's just a matter of there's you know why questions have to ripen in, in, in some level, right? When you ask why things are a certain way, uh, that kind of question may or may not have an answer. 
Why questions have an answer within a context, right? If you say, why did this glass of wine fall onto the floor? Oh, because I swung my elbow and I hit it. Well, that, that, that assumes a whole bunch of things about elbows and wine glasses and how I could move through the room and so forth. A set of things that might not be available to us if we ask questions like, why is quantum mechanics true? It might be the answer that the why quantum mechanics is true. That's just the way it is. Stop. End of story. That might be it. Or it might be quantum mechanics is the simplest theory that obeys the following axioms. Or it might be the quantum mechanics is not true. We have a reason why, you know, we can ultimately find a reason why it looks like a pretty good approximation. So I just think, I think we don't have the right to demand ahead of time which one of those possibilities is going to work out. Hmm. I'm trying to decide what I think about that because on an intuitive level, it's kind of unsatisfying to say that's just the way it is, right? That is, this well, is it's how it is and we can't look further than that, right? This is, this is a, a thing that, I mean, I've, I've seen you, you do debates against, uh, who is that? Who's that theologian guy? Uh, William, William Lane, Lane Craig. Craig. I, I, yeah. saw him, I, I saw that debate with, you, with him and you. And the thing that sort of struck me was that it seemed like you were both, in some sense, claiming the same thing, that there are things that do not have reasons to be. He, was cl he is claiming that that thing is God, and you are claiming that that thing is theoretical physics, or like the, the base level of physical reality. And That's right. It, I guess, is, is there any way around that to say that there, there actually is nothing? I guess not, otherwise it's just turtles all the way down. Well, you know, look, Aristotle had this internal dialogue 2,500 years ago, right? right? And he said, if you think that there are chains of explanations, then there's two choices. Either they go back infinitely far or they terminate at some level. And he said, they can't go back infinitely far because that would be bad. And he said, if they terminate at some level, they can't terminate at just any old place. So there has to be something that acts as an explanation for other things, but isn't ex it itself explained by anything else. The unmoved mover, the uncaused cause, right? right. Uh, what in modern theological parlance, we would call a necessary being. So someone like William Lane Craig would say the difference is that the universe and our properties of the universe are explained by things that are more fundamental than them. But God doesn't need an explanation because God is necessary. We can't make sense of the world without the existence of God. So I disagree with all of the different arguments made in that uh, particular set of arguments. I don't right. think that there are any such thing as necessary beings. I don't think there's any problem with having a chain of causes that ends at some place. I also don't think there's any problem with having chains of causes that go back infinitely far. And, you know, uh, this, this is fitting in with the philosophy I already said, which is that what right do we have to demand aspects of the universe work in a certain way before we go out and look at them? We should be open-minded. Maybe there's an infinite chain of explanations. Maybe just grounds out somewhere. We'll have to find out when we're much closer to doing so. I suppose the challenge is that eventually it'll it'll become indistinguishable in terms of experiment. Like it's already getting pretty close now. Yeah, exactly. I think that's a that's a very deep point that you know at some point uh, our ability to improve our understanding of the universe at this fundamental level might slow down. I mean, it might even already be slowing down. I think it's probably not quite slowing down yet, but. Uh, you know, we've learned a lot, and that doesn't mean that we're anywhere near knowing everything, but it becomes harder and harder to learn more things when they become further and further away from the experiments we can do. So you wrote this, your latest book is The Big Picture. It's, yeah. your, it's your take on basically, basically everything. <laughs> um, yep. What made you want to step back and do this, like, large-scale project to try, to try and s sum up your understanding of the world as a whole, as opposed to sticking to, say, physics or whatever else? Well, like we started talking about, you know, I'm not very good at sticking to anything. So <laughs> I think that was definitely part of it, that I've just always been interested in things in addition to physics, you know, whether it's philosophy or biology or history or, or human ethics and culture. Um, so I figured that this book might be a way to leverage the fact that I'm purportedly an expert in physics to talk about a whole bunch of things that no one would think I'm an expert in. Um, and I don't pretend to be an expert. You know, I think that I, I do, I'm, I'm certainly not walking into all these areas and saying, don't worry, I'm the physicist, I'm here, I will clean them all up and explain them to you. I'm very much on the side of saying that 
the these different angles of attack on understanding the universe have individually important things to offer, whether it's biology and chemistry or literature and moral philosophy, right? Th these are not reducible to physics in any way. But they do, I claim, have to fit together. So physics has to be compatible with these other things. If you base your moral philosophy on a view of the world which is contradicted by our best scientific understanding, then you're probably wasting your time. So they need to be at least compatible with each other, even if they don't sort of determine each other. So I thought that was a sensible thing to do and to lay out that point. And the other aspect was, you know, when I go around and give talks about cosmology or particle physics or whatever, uh, people want to know how it impacts their lives, both in a trivial way of, you know, making a better iPhone, but also in a more profound way of who we are in the universe. What role do we have? What is our purpose here, etc.? And usually the scientific uh, impulse is to say, no, that's not the question you're supposed to be asking. We're supposed to be asking, you know, what fraction of helium there is in the universe, not why are we here. And at some point I figure, you know, if this is the question people want to know the answer to, then maybe this is the question we should try to answer occasionally. So that was my attempt to do that. So you, you, you said a couple sentences ago that these, these different sort of levels of analysis don't determine each other. Because I would sort of think that you, you, you would be saying that there is a... The bottom level sort of determines the levels above it, right? There is. It, yeah, it, it depends on your definition of the word determine. Okay. okay. So uh, the, certainly what happens in the world in some very straightforward, naive sense is determined by physics, right? So you can ask yourself, well, is our chemistry and biology determined by physics? Um, in some sense, clearly yes. But in another sense, there's a choice that comes in when we turn physics into chemistry or biology a choice of what we choose to look at, how we choose to group things together in the world, how we choose to coarse grain, a physicist would say, right? Mm. And there might be a reason why you choose to look at certain aspects of the world and call those biological organisms and not other things biological organisms. But to, if you were really, you know, had infinite knowledge of the fundamental physics and no other knowledge, you would never need to do that. You would just do fundamental physics. You would just describe the world as a quantum wave function of electrons and protons and so forth and go from there. So there's a little bit of extra choice that comes in when you choose to speak the vocabulary of these higher emergent levels of reality. That's the sense in which they're not determined because there is some subjective element, even if there's a reason why we choose one vocabulary over another. Right. But then when it comes to things like being a good person and deciding right from wrong, these are not questions about what happens in the universe. These are questions about what should happen in the universe or how we should behave in the universe. And those just aren't determined by physics at all. They're determined by very other, very different uh, considerations that we human beings might have. There's something to do with these different levels being a result of the way our minds work as well, the way we think, the fact that we can only hold, say, seven different things in our working memories at once sort of determines the way that you, you have to think about, uh, about different levels. So for example, once a system gets more complicated than 10 or so molecules, you need to figure out a way to group it together so that it makes sense again to you. Otherwise, it just overloads your actual cognitive capacity. So that's one of the ways that I, I think these, these different levels sort of fall out naturally. Or you could think about it, I guess, as sort of the uh, an infinity or, or uh, continuum limit, right? When you get up to a, yeah. for example, when, when you get to the point where molecules can be thought of as a continuum, maybe you transition to biology, where you're talking about um, fluids and uh, membranes and... Right, I mean, I think that's it. I think that uh, I actually don't like to talk about it in terms of our cognitive capacities. That makes us more important than we really are. I think that if you had an artificial intelligence organizing the world, it would come up with biology and chemistry the same way that we do. Okay. And I think it ultimately has to do with the fact that these are computationally efficient ways of talking about the universe. Hmm. You know, when you choose to describe a person as an agent with, uh, you know, a height and a weight and a skin color and certain attitudes and so forth, you're throwing away an enormous amount of information. You're not telling me the location and the velocity of every single one of the particles that make them up, right? But you hope that you're throwing away information that doesn't matter that much, that on the basis of which you wouldn't make a very different prediction for how that person was going to act. So you try to get like the most predictive bang for your informational buck 
is the idea. And I think that's in, that's that's sort of what our brains are doing, but it's independent of how our brains evolved in any particular way. Right. It's kind of the only way that a brain can evolve to actually efficiently think about the world. Yeah, that's right. Do you think that do you think that also applies to motivations and, and actions? Like I I've whenever I've seen you talk about this about sort of ought questions, you leave it very open to the idea that there are some things that are, are determined by choice and there are some things that are are that may have some sort of biological basis. I think I, I lean a little more towards the evolutionary side of, of thinking that a lot of the things that we're motivated to do, even with in terms of um, moral judgments and things like that, are a part of the way we've evolved, right? So it's it's very hard to value different things than the things most of us value. If you if someone doesn't value their family, you think of them as as somehow not the way humans are supposed to be, right? Um, well, you, I mean, you did a little cheat right there. Uh, there's two separate things you can ask about. One is, why do human beings value the things that they do? Right. That's a straightforward scientific question. Where did that come from? It has to do with evolution and history and genes and, and our education and things like that. But there's a deterministic scientific kind of explanation for why that might be true. There, but there's a whole other question. So what are you supposed to value? Right. right. And you slid right there in the little dialogue you just gave from what we do because of biology to what we're supposed to do. You say, like, well, someone who doesn't value their family, that's not what you're supposed to do as a human being. I don't think I don't think I said that. I think what I what I'm saying is that we also it's also kind of determined what we believe we're supposed to do. So I I would have a very hard time t thinking other than that you're supposed to care about your family. Right. But that's other people certainly disagree with you and they did. They evolved. I suppose that I suppose that's true, but there are, like, if you f if you find someone who believes that murder is okay, yeah, you you tend to believe that there there's something wrong with them, and if you believe that someone believes that murder should be considered to be okay, you also might believe that there's something wrong with them. Like, there's, but there's, clearly a lot of people think that murder is okay. Well, in very particular circumstances, but I think it, it gets into it gets into fringe cases where you're kind of playing different virtues off of each other to get into. Like you have to, you have to play the virtue of, say, preserving human life against the virtue of of justice or of self protection or something like that. If you really go to the easy cases where you just see a random person in the street and you decide to kill them, I don't think there's a whole lot of variation on that. How much variation does there have to be? <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, it's a separate kind of question. You're asking what 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 values people actually have evolved to have, and then you're asking what values should they have. And the fact that almost everybody agrees on some set of questions means precisely nothing to the question of what values should people have. It is, it is helpful to explain what values they actually have, but in fact the values they actually have are completely incoherent and unsystematic and unthought out and incompatible from person to person, and that's why we have moral discussion and dialogue. And the bases on which we have those moral discussions has to be more than just, well, we'll let the Schrodinger equation uh, evolve and, and see what happens, because we're talking at a much higher level of abstraction. and. To pretend that we've evolved in a certain way and therefore let's just all agree uh, to share the same basic values that all right-thinking people evolved to have, I think is not a very useful starting point for moral discussion. Fair enough. I th I, yeah, I think I would, I would claim that there are some shared moral intuitions that we, we have to begin with, but I'm certainly no moral philosopher. So. Well, but I mean, so I, I'm just, it, it's a, this is a f philosophical point, not, not a really a practical one, because in the practical real world, we do disagree a little bit, but we also agree a lot. Mm -hmm. There are shared agreements, and that's the basis on which we can move forward and, and try to systematize and learn how to cooperate with each other and share our communal space. But to, I think it is a category error to say that let us take the things we agree on and pretend that they're laws of nature. Right. As soon as we find one person who doesn't agree, that's obviously false. Well, I definitely agree with that. I think I would I would think of it more as if to to any extent that they're part of human nature, they would be solving the problem of evolutionary fitness, right? So it's if if there is a way to it it is a bad evolutionary strategy to want to murder the people within your community, right? It will it will decrease it will probably make them want to kill you. It will decrease the fitness of your of your overall community. You will not do well, right? So, so what? 
Well, I, that's a good question, so what? But I suppose it's, I find it useful to think about what are the ways that humans have had to evolve to live together in a, in a functional way. And maybe that can give you some intuition into what ways we actually live, because if we didn't live those ways, we would probably have killed each other off. Absolutely. And there's a separate question as to what ways we actually should live. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe we look, I've met people who think that the human race should go extinct. There are, there are clubs that think that is true. It is very anti-evolutionary, and uh, I don't agree with them, but if I said to them, no, because your strategy would be not very successful in terms of evolutionary fitness, I think they have the right to say to me, so what? That's not, I don't care about evolutionary fitness. So the, the point is, over and over again, and this is what David Hume said, and, and people still don't quite want to grasp, okay. there's many, many things that are more or less true about shared human values. But if someone is disagreeing with you, you can't do an experiment to show that they're wrong. You can't construct a logical proof to show that they're wrong. It's just a matter of subjective human agreement in the community. And the sooner we accept that, I think the better off we'll be. Let's bring it back to physics and uh, avoid, right. avoid too much conversation of morality. <laughs> um, I, I have another thing switching to general relativity that I, I want to know if you have a good explanation for. And it's a very simple thing, but it's the basis of, of the Einstein equation, right? The equation, the, the question is why, why should matter bend space? Why should energy bend space? Or is, is there a reason why it does in the particular way that it does? Or does it just seem to us to be that's the way it is and the way that we've measured it? Yeah, I mean, I think that it's, this is a tricky question because certainly we could imagine worlds in which there was no such thing as gravity, right? Einstein says that what gravity is, in the modern way of thinking about it, is the curvature of space-time itself. And you're asking, well, why? Is Number one, why is space-time curved at all? Number two, why does it get curved in the particular ways that it gets curved? Mm. And I think that the first question is hard because, again, like I said, we could imagine a world in which space-time was flat and there was no gravity. Maybe human beings couldn't live in that world or something like that. I'm not exactly sure, but it's a conceivable world as far as anyone knows. But given that you let space-time be curved, then it turns out that Einstein's particular equation, which relates the amount of space-time curvature to the amount of stuff in the universe, the equation that says the Earth creates a certain gravitational field around it, this is just far and away the simplest way that matter and energy can have this influence on space-time. Because there's a lot of restrictions on what it can be, right? Energy is conserved and things like that. Uh, space-time has invariance with respect to space and time in different ways. And so once you put down all the rules that we think that a good field theory in modern physics should obey, Einstein's particular equation relating space-time curvature to energy and momentum and so forth is just more or less the only thing you could imagine at the simplest possible level. You can imagine little corrections to it, and those corrections probably exist, but they're probably really, really, really small. Hmm. And because gravity is so weak, we'll probably never detect them in a laboratory. So it's the simplest equation that isn't just not an equation at all. That's exactly right, yeah. If, if space-time is going to be curved at all, you would certainly bet that this is the way it's going to be curved, and lo and behold, this is the way it's going to be curved. Does it, so that's th that sort of defines, because it's so weak, you could think that it's not actually that simple, it's just that that's the only part of it we can see, and everything else is sort of dampened by these massive scales of the, like, going from yes. the plank length to net to here. We've kind of found yeah, that's right. that's... the only piece of it that survived. That's exactly right. So we think that, you know, um, you can you can talk about these different ways that space-time could curve because of matter um, in terms of, well, how curved is it? And as, as a physicist, if you're well-trained in sort of perturbation theory, you start with, it's not curved at all, and then there's a little uh, explanation for why it gets a little bit curved, and then another explanation for why it gets a little bit more curved than that. And the fact is, space-time is just not that curved. The fundamental unit of length in quantum gravity is the Planck length, which is this really tiny bit. I don't even remember the number, 10 to the minus 35 centimeters or something like that, right? Um, so much smaller than all of these big length scales that we observe, the radius of the Earth, the size of a human being or whatever. So effects that only become important if you curve space-time on that scale are completely invisible to us in our gentle, slowly rolling world in which we live. Right, it's, the, it's sort of the Okay, so it, it's like the theory version of 
the parabola or the simple harmonic oscillator, where it's like there could be all sorts of complicated things going on, but if you only care about this this very weak region, you can treat right. it as just a, a curve like this and a spring that goes back and forth. And it doesn't exactly matter that right. whether it's, it's exactly. a pendulum or whether it's actually something that goes up and down and all over the place and it has corrections of cubic and quadratic and quartic orders. It's yeah. you can just treat it as a spring. Similarly, you can just treat space as Einsteinian because everything else is too weak to notice. That's right. And there's sort of um, other versions of this game you could play. So this is saying, well, why why isn't it the actual equation that Einstein wrote down much complicated? And the reason why is that for almost any equation you could write down, Einstein's equation is the first most important part of it. But there's other th questions you could ask, like, well, okay, why is there only one way in which space-time has a geometry? Why doesn't space-time have two different kinds of geometry? Hmm. Or why isn't there some other fields in addition to the space-time geometry that affect it in some profound way? And for every one of those other possibilities, physicists have gone through and asked, you know, could you make it work? And they found a reason why it's very, very unlikely that that's how the world would be. So it, it really is a, a very nice case where, uh, with one, sorry, with one very profound exception, the world works exactly like you'd expect it should. And that profound exception is the energy of empty space the so-called vacuum energy or the cosmological constant, this reasoning that makes things very, very simple, also says there should be a whopping big amount of energy in empty space, and that's not there. We think that there is some energy in empty space, but it's only a very, very tiny, minute amount. That's still a big mystery to us. Hmm. Are there other things that, like, what are your favorite things that you still find confusing or that you don't properly have an answer to? Yeah, and well, that's a big one. You know, the, the amount of energy density in empty space is certainly a favorite one. And I think the classic question is how quantum mechanics gets reconciled with dynamical space-time, with general yeah. relativity, the problem of quantum gravity. And I, I, my suspicion right now is that people have been coming at it a little bit backwards. They start from space-time and try to apply the rules of quantum mechanics to it. I think that it's more likely to succeed if we start with the rules of quantum mechanics and try to find space-time within it. Because since, as we started saying, I'm an Everettian, and I think that the universe is very simple at heart, it's just a quantum state evolving over time, that quantum state doesn't come attached with labels like, here's an electron, here's space-time, here's a photon, or whatever. All of those are convenient, higher-order labels, just like biology and chemistry are, to the physicist. So we need to find space and time and fields and forces in that quantum mechanical state. And that's a difficult project that we're sort of just beginning to take seriously right now. Isn't that what, that's sort of what string theory did as well, isn't it? They, they started with just here's a string that vibrates and sort of found space out of it? Yeah, you know, yes and no. I mean, that the, their strings were always vibrating in space. What right. they found was that it, certain spaces work and certain spaces don't. Okay. And the good news is that the ones that work sort of obey an equation that is basically Einstein's equation for general relativity. The bad news is that they're all ten-dimensional space times. Uh, but the you know the the ameliorating factor footnote is that you can take six of those dimensions and hide them in various clever ways. Hmm. So that's you know it's not quite as pretty like if you had done string theory and we actually lived in 10 dimensions you would that everyone would think it was right by now but the fact that we don't makes things a little bit trickier right although it gives you it gives you some of those rotational symmetries in folded up dimensions that you actually need to make, you make lemonade work. out of these extra dimensional lemons yes you can but whether or not nature actually does that is still unclear mm. well um i think I'll, I'll give you the the last word i want to thank you for for your time um, coming on here, but if there's if there's anything in particular that you're trying to to tell the masses to get them to to get people to understand <laughs> that you're is, is is there some some bug in your head that's going? I wish people got this better. Um, one more platform to do that, I suppose. Well, there's many things. I have a long list of pet peeves, but I will I'll direct one at my fellow colleagues in the physics world um, with respect to quantum mechanics, which is since we've been talking about it anyway already. Um, you know, I think that future historians will look back on the 20th century uh, history of physics with puzzlement because we did the great and wonderful thing of inventing quantum mechanics in the 1920s and it, it was a 
true paradigm shift away from how Newton would have given us classical mechanics to a wholly different way of looking at the world. And mysteries came along, unanswered questions, like this measurement problem that we talked about. And quantum mechanics is certainly the foundation of all of physics. And there's certainly this big problem here that we don't know the answer to. So you would have thought that most of the effort of 20th century physics would be devoted to trying to work out these very, very difficult questions of the measurement problem in quantum mechanics. Whereas what actually happened was it was basically ignored that if you work on the measurement problem of quantum mechanics, you will never get a job teaching physics in a major research university. It is, it is thought to be a waste of time. And I think that in the very far future, that will be looked at as a big mistake. We basically abandon our responsibility to really understand how the world works in this particular aspect. And I hope that we catch on that it's about time to take these questions more seriously. That's true. That's something I, I, I met someone not too long ago who said that they were going into philosophy to study like origins of quantum mechanics. And I yeah. thought it's, it's so strange that that's, it's wound up in philosophy departments. This is, this is our field. I know, you'll be kicked out. Many, many of the best philosophers of physics right now uh, got PhDs in physics and then left because the questions they were interested in are not taken seriously by physicists, and it's a shame. Mm, they're, they're not practical enough. They don't make weapons. Well, they don't, um, you know, you want, yeah, you want something tangible to put your finger on at the end of the day. You want, you want to sort of calculate something and get an answer out. It's a very, I think it's a very short-sighted view, and you can see why it works. It's sort of evolutionarily selected, you know, survival of the fittest. Crank out the papers, write down new models, get new results, fit the data, and it leaves us at the end of the day not quite understanding how the world works, and I think that's a shame. Well, if, you, if you're going with my model of, of, the, of our values being evolutionarily selected, there must be some value to just knowledge for the sake of knowledge, because it seems that all of us sort of start out interested in that and okay with that and trying to just get down to the basis of everything. I think so. I think we need to get back in touch with uh, that part of our original motivation for being scientists. Well, it's one of the things I'm trying to do, and I guess you Good. are too. So, <laughs> Okay, well, thanks for, thanks for coming on. This has been great. All right, sure, Tim. Thanks. Uh, good luck with the podcast. It seems like a lot of fun.